here. Thanks for joining us for this evening's event. My name is Kevin. I'm one of the event hosts here at Powell's Books. And before we begin, I want to encourage you to check out our lineup of upcoming virtual events by visiting our website at powells.com. And if you don't already do so, please follow us on social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, as well as our YouTube channel. Tonight, we're very excited to welcome Paul Levy in conversation with Andrew Harvey. In its Native American meaning, Watiko is an evil cannibalistic spirit that can take over people's minds, leading to selfishness, insatiable greed, and consumption as an end in itself, destructively turning our creative genius against our own humanity. Revealing the presence of Wetiko in our modern world behind every form of destruction our species is carrying out, Paul Levy shows how this mind virus is so embedded in our psyches that it is almost undetectable, and it is our blindness to it that gives Wetiko its power. Yet as Levy reveals in striking detail in his new book, Wetiko, Healing the Mind Virus That Plagues Our World, by recognizing this highly contagious mind parasite, we can break free and realize the vast creative powers of the human mind. Levy explores how artists, philosophers, and spiritual traditions across the ages have been creatively symbolizing this deathly pathogen of the psyche so as to help us see it and heal it. He's joining us tonight right here in Portland, Oregon. Levy is joined in conversation by Andrew Harvey, writer, poet, translator, mystical teacher, and the author of, the, of Hope, A Guide to Sacred Activism, The Return of the Mother, and about 40 other books. He has taught all over the world, given over 20 courses for the SHIFT Network, and is the founder of the Institute for Sacred Activism. He's joining us tonight from Oak Park, Illinois. This evening's event includes an audience Q&A. Please use that Q&A button that's at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to ask a question at any time. And if someone has typed a question that you'd also like to know the answer to, you can upvote the question by clicking the thumbs up button on their question. Most importantly, please support Paul and Powell's by purchasing a copy of his book from us. A link to buy with Tico, as well as a link to buy Andrew's books will be shared in the chat a couple of times this evening. Paul, Andrew, we're really thrilled to welcome you both this evening. Thanks for being here. Yeah, I'm so happy to be here. And yeah, just really want to thank you, Andrew, for joining me. Are you kidding me? I would try and stop me. Look, let's plunge in. We're going to talk for half an hour and then open it up for your questions for Paul. Hello, everyone. I just want to say to you from the bottom of my heart that this book, with Tico, Healing the Mind Virus That Plagues Our World, is quite simply the most important book written for a very long time. And it's brilliant beyond belief, and it's written by an authentic visionary genius. And it goes straight to the heart of understanding the forces, the dark and terrible and destructive forces that are now quite obviously erupting in what is quite obviously an apocalyptic situation. For years, I've been challenging the spiritual world to face this. And for years, I've been begging the major spiritual teachers to tell the truth to everyone about where we are, not to terrify us, but to prepare us, to alert us, to ask us to go through a much deeper transformation so that we can rise to the challenge of this apocalypse and birth a new world and a new culture in and through it. And I cannot thank Paul enough for having done the quite extraordinary work that he has done. When I read his book, Quantum Revelation, I finally began to begin to understand the extraordinary contributions of modern physics. I'd read many other books on modern physics, but Paul brought it all together with his lucidity and brilliance and passion and enthusiasm in such a way that I found myself ruining myself and giving copies of it to everybody I knew. And then I plunged into his work on Wetiko. And I realized that this is the work that the whole spiritual movement now needs to get 
down with. Because if you and I and the whole spiritual movement doesn't begin to face the power of the dark in our world, we will either be unconscious agents of it or we will be destroyed by it. So, Paul, thank you so much for the absolutely amazing book that you've created for us. And I want to begin by asking you, why Wetiko? What is it about this vision of Wetiko that has possessed you not just to write dispelling Wetiko, but now this book, and I gather two others potentially. What is it that has seized you so deeply? Yeah, well, no, I, that's, that, that's a great question. And I'm not writing as a scholar or an academic or creating a theory. Um, this book came out of my own personal experience. I had a close encounter with Watiko. This was, you know, I'm 65 now when I was in my early 20s, and it almost killed me. And it destroyed my entire family. And, um, and it almost drove me completely insane. You know, maybe some people think, that's not true. Maybe they, that some people th think of me as insane, but the point is, is <laughs> that all of a sudden, <laughs> yeah, all of a sudden I had to come to terms with something. I didn't consciously make a choice, but all of a sudden there was this incredibly dark energy that was in my field, that was in my life and had, you know, had, had come into my mind. And um, so I had to wrestle with it 24 seven for decades. And more and more, I began to, to realize that, um, you know, I, I was beginning to alchemically transmute this incredible evil that had come into my life. And I began to understand, oh, wow, encoded, hidden within the Watiko spirit, because that is really the spirit of evil. It's like, but it's a quantum phenomena that encoded within it is um, the medicine, is its own vaccine. And it literally introduced me to the, this incredible creativity that was inside of me. And, and then I began to realize, wow, this is something that's actually operating all throughout the field, the non-local field. This is something that everybody is dealing with, but just in, in different ways and whether they know it or not. And it's informing the events in our world. And, you know, I began to realize, oh my God, the, the real medicine for this this evil, this Watiko spirit, is to tap into being creative. And so I was really inspired by Watiko itself to discover my work and to actually write my books, you know. So what is this Watiko? What is this dark force? One of the extraordinary yeah. things which we'll talk about in a minute about this new book is that you give for the first time ever an overview from all of the mystical traditions, the really serious ones, about yeah, yeah. this dark force and its inescapable reality. But what yeah, is yeah. this dark force? What is Wetiko? Why do we need to get really in touch with it right now in this situation that we're in? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, every spiritual tradition is talking about that the real light is to be found within the darkness. And if, if Watiko didn't exist, we have to invent it. It's incredibly important because it's actually catalyzing the evolution of our species. And, um, but you see, Watiko is this, it's like a revelation. It's a living revelation. It's teaching us something that we desperately need to know. But if we don't actually have the recognition of what it's showing us, then it's programmed to kill us. And, you know, and the thing which is, so, you know, I, what I don't want to do is, um, you know, is to sort of create fear in people that there's this mind virus and we need to be afraid. No, because what Tico, it feeds off of fear. And, um, you but know, you have that to really, realize it, you have to identify it. Oh, yeah. Well, the thing is, because it only has power over us to the extent we don't see it. Exactly. Okay? And to the extent that, that we have this blindness to it then it has us because then it operates through our blind spots and then we unwittingly become an instrument to act it out in our lives. So that's why in a way this book and, and all of my work is trying to help people to see Watiko because once you see it, you take away its power over you and you yourself become empowered because just what, the thing about Watiko, the source of it and the solution is within, within us. 
is within the human psyche. Absolutely. But one of the things that you've met is a great deal of opposition for this in the beginning, because the so-called new age is catastrophically incapable of facing the shadow. In fact, denies that the shadow with its lethal potential exists. So yeah, what would yeah. you say to all of those who are still trapped yeah. in that fantasy? Right. Well, I would point out that if you're turning away from the shadow, which is actually an avoidance of, of being in relationship to a part of yourself, that turning away, you're unwittingly feeding Watiko. Okay. And but if you come too fascinated by it, yeah, then you're unwittingly feeding it too. But what I'm pointing at is to see it, to see how it works through the outside world and through your own unconscious, how we actually, you know, through our reactions and through our unconscious, how we actually can become a vector for Watiko. When you see that, then you realize, oh, as a sovereign being, I get to choose where I place my attention and I want to invest my attention in creating the world I want to live in. That's kryptonite to Watiko. Okay. Well, it's very important at this moment, isn't it, to see where Tico, because it's erupting everywhere. We've just gone through oh. COP26 when they've done virtually nothing to address the catastrophic climate situation. We're living in a time in which American democracy is hanging by a burning thread and in which the birth of American fascism, right. which could potentially begin the end of the planet very quickly, is not only possible but even likely and yeah, we're yeah. looking at a rise of authoritarianism all over the world and very we're dark. looking at a very cruel terrifying kind of capitalism which is hobbling and destroying people so we're living yeah. in wetiko world yeah 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 and, 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 and identify it we're screwed yeah well the thing is no absolutely we're the thing about wetiko it's a collective psychosis and it's playing out. It's at the bottom of all of the collective madness that we're playing out and all of Absolutely. the evil that we're playing out. But the thing is, is that you see encoded in its manifestation is it's, it's like I was saying, it's actually offering us something because Jung himself was totally turned on to Watiko, but he didn't have the name. He kept on calling it different names, but the main name he called it was totalitarian psychosis. Right. Okay, now the totalitarian psychosis, if you think about how Watiko works, it gets into our minds and then it sets up like this shadow government. It colonizes the psyche. It dictates to the ego. It subsumes all the healthy parts of the psyche into its service. And the person so afflicted has no idea at all. They just, you know, and, and meanwhile, they're unwittingly being this instrument to act out Watiko. Now, what I just described of that inner condition of somebody who has Watiko, you can see the Watiko is an inner disease of the soul that actually expresses itself via the medium of the outside world. So when you have the realization, oh, the totalitarian forces that are playing out in the world and are insidiously creeping over our planet, that's actually reflecting what happens when a psyche is infected with Watiko. So the point is, when you see that, when you recognize the outer is reflecting the inner, that's to recognize the dreamlike nature. And that's to begin to wake up. So that's what I'm talking about, that encoded, it's a quantum phenomena, Watiko. Right. Encoded in the virus, it's actually helping us. But if we don't actually you know, recognize that, then it kills us. One of the most wonderful things that Jesus said was a real seeker has to combine the innocence of the dove and right. the wisdom of the serpent. Right. And Blake said wisdom is sold in the desolate market where none come to buy. And without the wisdom of the serpent at the deepest, most radical level, exactly the kind of wisdom that you're describing, the innocence of the dove is useless in transforming reality. Right, right. So where we've totally. come to, it seems to me, is an evolutionary crisis of massive proportions, yeah, which yeah, is yeah. challenging us to claim our addiction to Wetiko, not to be overwhelmed by it, but to use the wisdom that we will get from that challenge to start, in your words, dreaming together a wholly new way of being and doing everything. Yeah, because what you're saying, it makes me think like, you see, the thing about Watiko, it it, it's not creative at all. It has no creativity. Right. Now, the apocryphal text, 
I mean, every spiritual tradition is pointing out what Tico, just they don't use that word. In the apocryphal text, they talk about the counterfeiting spirit. And the counterfeiting spirit, it's precisely a description of what Tico. So it impersonates us, say in this, in this fictitious identity, oh, I'm wounded, I'm limited. As soon as we identify with that, then it has us because then like a puppet on a string, we it's we're under its control. It can, you know, manipulate us all at once, but it can't touch the true part of us. When we're identified with the true nature, it can't touch us at all. So the point is one way of really understanding what Tico, when we identify with that fictitious version, we have, what have we done? We've given ourselves away. We've identified with who we're not and we've disconnected from our creative agency. That's total madness. And that is Watiko. The point is, is that we, each one of us, 24 seven right now, we are have this incredible creative power, but because we're unaware of it, we're unconscious of it, then just like a dream, when you're unconscious of something, it gets projected out and picked up by the dream. So then there, you know, and the state is really, or whoever is really happy to, to own our own creative power and turn it against us. So that in essence is what Watiko does. And that's why the, the, the real medicine for it is to tap into our, our genius, our creative agency, our creative power, and, and to understand that we actually are creating our experience of ourselves and our experience of the world each and every moment. But if we don't know we're doing that, then, then Watiko will turn our creative energy against us in a way that's that's killing us. And when that's actually getting, you know, playing out all over the world, then what like you see what's happening in the world, we're actually we're committing collective suicide. Behind you is a Tibetan Buddhist shrine. So it's not just connecting with our genius, our creativity. That's, of course, essential. But it's also going even deeper than that, going on a path to discover what I would call the divine and you would call the Buddha nature in no. as our essential identity. And that discovery releases all the other powers, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's why, like when, you know, people, when they hear about this mind virus or evil and all that, and I, I try to tell people, no, don't, don't get afraid because that's just feeding what But the idea being is that you see, Watiko isn't, it's our ally. It's actually helping us. It's helping us to like remember who we are and to connect with our Buddha nature. And it's actually catalyzing our species to evolve. That's what I meant when I was saying, yeah, if it, if it didn't exist, we'd have to invent Watiko. It's actually our ally. You know, it's forcing us to get in touch with who we are. It's forcing us to make, to, to tap into our divine inheritance, to connect with our genuine power to our genuine creativity, you know? How did you tap into your own divine inheritance? Because I've, I've known you now for 30 years and I've seen you at stages of this amazing journey that you've been on and you've inspired and moved me so much. Help other people tap into that. Yeah, I, I, can, I, yeah, I can answer that really simply. And what did it for me was incredible over the top, this suffering yeah. that all of a sudden, I, and I won't go into the story, I, there was just this incredible suffering that came my way and it stopped me from living my life. And, you know, it could have really screwed me up. Um, and I went deeply inwards trying to understand what was going on and what was the source of that suffering. And I'm still a work in progress. It's not like, oh, I'm this enlightened person. No, I'm just an ordinary person. <laughs> but, but, you know, I, it was the suffering and and just more and more you know just being present with it and embracing it and trying to understand what was going on and because what it was like it was like there was in some sort of evil force you see the thing about our species it's not just that we're asleep it's as if there is some sort of darker power that's right. invested in keeping us asleep and that was my subjective experience and i was tripping out over that going what is happening this is so unbelievable and so I just committed my life to trying to heal myself, basically. And I'm still, you know, I'm still a work in progress, like, like I was saying. But as a result of doing that, I more and more began to discover, you know, what I, what I now, you know, the, the idea of Watiko. 
And that helped me to, to, to contextualize everything. This everything all of a sudden made so much sense in what was playing out in my personal life, collectively and inside of my mind. And, um, you know, because the thing is like in a fairy tale, when you find the name of a demon, you take away its power, you right. know? And it's not important that, you know, the name be Watiko. Every spiritual tradition calls it, you know, by different names. It, it doesn't make a difference what the name is. But when you find the name, you objectify it, you actually see it. So my whole thing, and in the book, what I'm trying to help people to do is to see it. But you see, it's really interesting because it's not an object. If you think, oh, I see Watiko and it looks like this and it has this shape and form. No, no, it's formless. And yet it can take on any form. And the psyche that's investigating Watiko is the very medium through which Watiko operates. So it's it's re, it becomes a spiritual practice, you know, to really try to to understand and try to actually see. But what isn't it, that the point? I think that you were, let's use the word saved. It's a it's a silly word, but it's, actually it's not a silly word. I think you were saved by finding a discipline that truly married your deepest passions in Tibetan Buddhism. So yeah, is one yeah. of the things that you're saying is please everybody get with a serious spiritual discipline that will enable you to experience your inner core as deathless and awake and dreaming in the deepest and holiest sense your experience. Yeah, 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 absolutely. You know, spiritual practice and a creative practice yes. and the idea of finding, hearing your call you know, really connecting with your calling and finding your, you know, being able to, the inner voice and the outer voice, really being able to creatively express yourself. Because the thing is, what I began to understand over decades was that, oh, well, there's a part in me that you could call it the higher self or wisdom or something. And we all have that. And all of a sudden, you know, I was in such deep trouble with overwhelming suffering that you know, every night I'd go to sleep and I'd have these dreams, these unbelievable dreams, night after night after night for a number of years. And I began to understand, oh, I was cultivating, it was like having a relationship, an intimate relationship with the unconscious. And it was teaching me and it was showing me. And the idea is that's something that each one of us can do. And you see, and, and that's what Watiko, it's actually helping us to do that. It's forcing us to do that. And, you know, just to say right now at the time in history we're at as a species, you know, if, if we don't really, uh, you know, just, and it starts with the individual. It's not, I mean, yeah, you can you know, create new laws or legislation. That's important, but that doesn't really do it. The point is any one of us, when we actually, whether you call it see our shadow or wake up to the dream or understand the quantum nature or Buddha nature or see what go, it's all just different words for describing the thing, the, you know, um, the, the same thing that actually has a non-local effect on the field, it makes it easier for all the rest of us because we're not separate. Do you see the thing about what go, it's actually helping us to see through the separate self that we don't exist as an isolated skin encapsulated ego, but we're interdependent and interconnected with each other. And when you begin to realize that, the expression is compassion. And that's the Watiko Dissolver par excellence. Compassion and service. It's not just compassion. It's compassion in action, isn't it? Look at you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, when, yeah. I, when I think of you, of knowing you for 30 years and the journey that you've been on, this is what I think. I think that the teachers who are helping people the most at this moment have in a way gone through the crisis that the whole world is about to go through before. And that what you went through is what now the whole of human society is going to go through. A massive breakdown on every level of all previous ways of consciousness and all solutions. And what's yep. so wonderful about your journey is that the fact that you were able to go through this in such a massive and terrifying, but ultimately so healing way, gives people not only the map of what they're going to be facing soon, if they're not facing it now already, but also the way through. 
And you've mentioned three ways through. You've mentioned really a deep spiritual practice so you can connect with your essential self, whatever word you give to it. Yeah. You've mentioned creativity, and I love you for doing that because one yeah. of the things that you and I have both had for so many years is the passion to write, the passion to speak, the passion mm -hmm. to give. But everybody has their creativity, and combining pouring out your creativity with a really serious spiritual path is so important at this moment. Yeah. And the third thing, and this is my work, but I know it's your work too, is activism inspired by sacred yeah. inspiration, because we must now act from an inspired sacred consciousness together on every level, wisely calmly but very urgently because if we don't fascism will be born in this country the climate will collapse the system will increasingly devastate our souls and minds and hearts and bodies and and we will in the end or quite soon end this experiment so if yeah. you bring all of those together but the one thing that i think we, i'd love to talk to you before we end our discussion and open it up for questions is you and I share a great love of Jung yeah. and the other key element to this journey it seems to me is to combine all of those three with a real deep immersion in transpersonal psychology because yeah, that yeah. will give us over time the ability to negotiate the crazy waves of the unconscious so could you end by just yeah. speaking about what you've learned from Jung and the yeah 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 if I hadn't found Jung I don't think I would have made it because I was right in the throw I had just gotten out so here I had this incredible suffering I went so deeply inwards, I had this awakening. And then within 24 hours, I got thrown in mental hospitals and misdiagnosed as being mentally ill. And, you know, for a couple of years, the next couple of years, maybe three, four, five other times that happened. And then I got out and then I had the trauma of that. And I, all the, all the while I knew something, I was, that I was having a spiritual awakening and, but I was trying to understand and contextualize. And then I found Jung. And he all of a sudden spoke my language because he had his own version of what I had gone through with, with his confrontation with the unconscious. And um, so, you know, I've never taken a course in Jung. I'm not a Jungian analyst or a scholar or anything like that, but he's my main man in the sense that I study him more than anyone. And when you find somebody who find, you know, who they find, it's like they, they're speaking the words that map onto your experience that helped me to understand because I had my entire world was reflecting back that I was mentally ill and in denial of my illness. And, you know, finding young really, really helped me. And just the final thing, just what you were saying about being in service, that's the thing when you actually, so here's, you know, the Watiko virus, which is helping us to see through the illusion that we exist separate from anybody or anything that we're actually part of the quantum field, we're interconnected with each other. And then, like we were saying, compassion arises. Well, then, of course, the, the natural instinct is to be of service. And then you, you discover that, oh, but my nature is creative. That is our nature. It's not like you have to first become creative. If you think you're not creative, what's actually happening is that you're so creative that you're actually creating the experience of convincing yourself that you're not creative that's how, <laughs> that's how creative so you true. are you know and so yeah and of course what this is all about is to be of service and we as a species are potentially awakening and we're evolving and when there are certain of you know of us who are tapped into that to whatever degree we are we discover, oh, we can connect with other people who are also awakening and get in phase with them and, you know, reinforce and support each other's awakening in a way that's a win-win, in a way that helps all of us. And that's what Watiko is inspiring us to do, because if we don't get that message, it's going to kill us. And if we do get that message, it's going to rebirth us yeah, yeah. as a new kind of humanity and embody right. divine humanity, much more skillful, much more humble, much more creative. And if we get to that place, we'll be able to co-create with the divine a new world. Right. No, that's absolutely true. And, and one can right. see that in a dream. When you, when you awaken in a dream and connect with other of your dream characters in that dream, 
you know, and have that realization, oh, this dream is a function of our dreaming. We are literally dreaming it up. And when enough people get in phase, you, you discover, oh my God, we can change the dream. That's what our situation is in the waking dream. That's what's being offered to us to have the realization that we can participate consciously in our own evolution. And one last thing for people who haven't connected with you before, what is the work that you do daily to encourage this in your awakening to the dream? Oh, well, I mean, the one hand, there's my personal practice. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a very devoted practitioner, but then just being creative. And then I meet with people. I have a private practice. And then I have all these groups and, and a community that's actually forming around the world um, of and people who are plugging into this. Paul? What's the well, community? the one, is, okay, it's basically called the awakening in the dream community because right. it's what happens when people are awakening in the dream and you realize, oh, we can come together as, as dream characters in each other's dream and contemplate what that would mean if we are actually waking up. What if we took that seriously and stepped into that? What would that look like? Wow. And, you know, and then, I mean, it's just all bets are off as far as what's, what's possible, you know? So I'm thinking how about to open it up for some uh, Q and A. I can get you started on that. Uh, we have a couple of questions from the audience. A reminder, you can ask your questions using the Q&A button that's at the bottom of your screen. Um, the first one is coming uh, from Carmen. Um, they say, I teach Gen Z students at UC Berkeley as an adjunct. My students inspire me. They act to make the world kinder in concrete ways, creating nonprofits to address poverty, climate devastation, racism, inequalities inhumanities committed against the LGBTQ community. They also suffer greatly from stress, social media bombardment, and what you uh, would call uh, society's collective psychosis. What can, those, what can those of us who are teachers do to help our students in these perilous times? What should we be teaching them and doing? And what advice do you have for teachers? Yeah. So should I go in or do you want to? Oh, please go. Yeah, on. okay. Yeah, well, well, for me, you know, what comes up is, you know, where, the, so the person in the role of the teacher, if they can really embody, you know, to not just talk about, you know, ideas about, oh, you should do this, or you should do that, because if they're incongruent, you know, and out of phase with themselves, you know, that's way more important than the words that they'll be saying. And um, so the fact that if they can really be a model and embody what it is to be an awakened human being, and not in a final sense, because who is awakened? You know, we're all in the process of awakening. And, um, but that involves also, we all have a shadow. We all act out our unconscious. So part of being, um, you know, this being in the process of awakening is when we act out our shadow, our unconscious, and it gets reflected back to try to own that and really self-reflect. And when people see that, that itself is so incredibly inspiring for people. All right, um, another question we have here. Um, this is for Andrew. Uh, it says, I know you were on the Enneagram Summit earlier this week. Would you say the shadows of our personality types is where we need to be to bring healing? Absolutely, but I think one of the challenges that Paul is really laying out brilliantly in this book, and you have to read it, is that he's saying it's not just the shadows of our own personality types. I'm a four, so I have lots of shadow to deal with, and anybody on the Enneagram does. It's the fact that there is a massive shadow in the nature of reality itself. The one, if you could call it the one, the one that is here, that is everything, that every, interconnects everything. That's my language. Paul is a Buddhist, so he would call it something different, but it's the same thing. The one contains both the light and the dark and uses very ferocious ap archetypal dark forces to work its stupendous alchemy. The ancient mystical systems have always known this, but this knowledge had to be brought back by Jung and other great mystics in the 20th century and was, has been almost totally ignored by the 
new age. So one of the great achievements of this book is to introduce you to the different visions of this archetypal dark force, what St. Paul calls the powers and principalities in the one, so that not only are you addressing your own shadow stuff, which is where that those dark forces can manipulate you from, but you're also coming to understand the necessity of connecting with your own inner light so as to be able to see ever more subtly how these archetypal dark forces work and how to protect yourself from them by not only seeing them but also building in yourself a force and power of embodied light presence so does that strike you as, as a decent answer paul is that yeah i was just i was thinking god i couldn't have said it better myself yeah so um no that's beautiful because you know i just want to say for me when when i all of a sudden you know was overwhelmed with suffering and then i had to encounter my shadow it wasn't just personal shadow it was the archetypal shadow and and that you know if you don't have a developed sense of self i mean that could just be overwhelming and it's not you know i was in my early 20s but what's happened is that over the over the over time many decades i it actually helped me to cultivate a stronger sense of self you know and then of course once you develop a sense of self you can you can have relationship with the true self you know and then at a certain point you more and more have the recognition that oh yeah that sense of self you know who you've been identifying with that was just a, in a way a transport system to get to the to the real self you know and that's the divine intelligence you know and that's just our wholeness and that's the individuation process that Jung was describing just having the ego self axis and you know really it's what I was pointing out before about getting into sort of having relationship with this part of yourself that's you know you know the higher self whatever there are a lot of names for it yeah uh next question um, it's from Sage and says, how is Watiko playing out in the vaccination divisions and oh, the hostility God. being played oh. out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So I can answer that, Andrew, if you <laughs> if you're if you're oh, okay with that. You, you, and and the yeah. that one, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm not gonna get into the content of being pro-vax or anti-vax or anything like that. But and in the book, I actually the whole last section is about COVID and about how the COVID pandemic, when you see actually it in a certain way, it can help you to see the Watiko mind virus. And that's the deadly virus that's really afflicting our species. But the thing about with the vaccine controversy is that I've never seen our world more polarized. And Watiko feeds off of polarization. It feeds off of fear. And, um, and then when with all the misinformation and the propaganda and the mind control and, and all of that, it's becoming harder and harder to really discern what's actually real and what's not real. And one of the ways Watiko works is through incapacitating our ability to discern. So what I'm pointing at is that if you wanna understand, if you wanna deepen your understanding more of how this mind virus works, a perfect contemplation is what's happening with the COVID pandemic and with the vaccines to see, to trace it back and to realize, oh, well, all of what's happening where, you know, here we're actually interconnected, we're, we're one in a certain, you know, you can say in a very simple way, but here when Watiko comes into the room, all of a sudden we're separate and polarized. And one other way of understanding this is when Watiko comes into the room, basically you the experience is, oh my God, it's not safe to speak. I can't just be authentic. If I actually say what I'm really thinking or feeling, it's dangerous. I'll be attacked. I'll lose my friends. They won't love me. They'll, you know, it'll create incredible drama or upset and all that. And so if you think about what's happening with the whole vaccine thing or with the pandemic, you know, I notice for myself. I monitor who I can say what to. Oh, with these friends, I can't really talk about this. And if those friends, if I mention this, I'll get in trouble. And as compared to just being myself and being authentic. And that's an expression that Watiko is actually present. Fabulous reply. I love that. Uh, here's a question uh, says, 
uh, can you possibly translate what Watiko is on the Tibetan Buddhist worldview? Yeah. Oh, I can do that, really. Um, when you get down to it, before I knew the word Watiko, I actually, I was tracking it, but I didn't have the name, and I called it malignant egophrenia, M-E disease, me disease. It's a misidentification of who we think we are. And so in Tibetan Buddhist thought, the real, what the Buddha realized is that the source of our suffering is, you could say, the self-contraction, is our clinging. We're clinging onto a self that actually doesn't even exist in the way that we're imagining it does. And then we're investing all of our energy in protecting it and identifying with it, and it doesn't even exist. And that clinging is the source of our suffering. And that's actually, you know, just a perfect description of Watiko. It's a perfect description in the fire sermon. The world is burning to death in the fires of greed, ignorance, and craving. That's Watiko. Right. Right. Oh, totally. The three poisons. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to find the, uh, there's a lot of questions here. Um, here's one that says, uh, what exactly mean, what exactly do you mean, uh, quote, being present within my suffering? Uh, she says, I'm so overwhelmed often and going easily unconscious or even into a trance. Yeah. I, I can answer that because I'm so familiar with the whole suffering thing, you know, and what I've noticed for years um, is that, you know, I'd be doing my meditation and I'm all chill and good and harmonic, you know, and present and all of a sudden something would happen and I would realize, well, I just left, I would just dissociate, I would just get distracted. And I began to wonder about that and, and more and more I was able to cultivate awareness around what happened at that, you know, and it was clear I was getting close to some deep, you know, whatever pain or trauma or abuse or something like that. And then you just, I began to like going to going, you know, to, to the, you know, to get your muscles bigger, going to the gym. I was cultivating that muscle of awareness of being present right at the moment when I would unconsciously split and I would just presence it and I would be you know, more and more able to infuse that moment, that edge of where I would in the past dissociate of just presencing it with awareness. And it was like that muscle was getting bigger and bigger and bigger to the point where, you know, I would actually be able to find the presence via the experience of the suffering of the moment that I would want to dissociate that itself would stimulate my awareness and I would then bring presence to that. We have a question uh, from Diana. It says, do you think that one Wetiko upon our culture could be called dominion? That is the premise that society can only be structured in a dominance hierarchy in which the higher the status, the greater the freedom, power and wealth. Well, um, so yeah, I mean, for me, the, I, I, I just want to point out, it can be, you see, we cast spells by our language. And I mean, how do you make a word? You spell it. And the idea, if we have a thought that society can only be like hierarchical or patriarchal or, you know, power over, you know, with people in the position of, you know, being in positions of power over others, that's a self-limiting spell because I totally see the possibility that when our species wakes up sufficiently, we understand that we're all in this together. And if I help you, it helps me. That is to see through the separate self. And that, that's to break out of the spell of power over, but you know, to step into power with or just being in service. And that's all an expression of just you know, seeing through that imagination that we exist in a way that we don't. That's what Tico and actually having the recognition of who we are to each other. We're, we're relatives, we're related, we're not separate. And when you realize that, that totally dissolves any sort of negative patriarchy or hierarchy or anything like that. Uh, we have a question here. Um, Paul, would you say more about the ways with Tico helps us to evolve? especially in relationships to our personal dream life? Yeah, for sure. No, I, I, can, I can answer that because think about it. You know, 
when all of a sudden you get out of balance and you're one sided, what does the psyche do? It, you know, it sends us dreams and dreams are compensations, you know, and then if we if we get the, sim, the symbology of the dream and we really take it in, then we get back in balance and we're all good. Um, but, you know, if we don't get that, that, you know, what the dream is, is showing us and we don't understand the, what the symbols are expressing, well, then what happens? We have a recurring dream. It happens again and again and again, and it gets more and more and more amplified. And so the idea is, you know, I point out not only that this is a dream, this is a collectively shared dream, but a way to understand and to see what Tico is to actually interpret this reality, this world, as if it's a dream and interpret it. What would this mean if it were a dream? And then, you know, then all of a sudden stuff opens up in your mind as far as how to see things. Instead of being fixed in a viewpoint, we begin to contemplate stuff from omni-perspectival points of view. And, um, you know, and then our energy, then our creative energy starts to flow. Well, how come that is? How come our consciousness just expanded? It was because Watiko. Watiko was actually the factor that destabilized us in, in the first place. So is Watiko like chaos in Prigogine's theory, that K where Tico is the agent no. of the chaos that births a much richer deal. Well, exactly. Well, in alchemy, the prima materia, one of the translations is the raw chaos. And if you don't have the prima materia, the shit, the rejected stuff, you can't make the alchemical gold. You know, the whole out the, the whole point of alchemy at first, they have to find the prima materia. If they don't find it, there's no way of making the enlightened mind, which is that is the lapis. <laughs> It's a question from Melanie. Uh, how do we help reach the field of psychology, which seems to be infected by Wittigo? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's really interesting because I mean, I just gave a presentation, you know, to a whole bunch of psychologists, and then a friend of mine who was one of them, you know, he reflected back to me. Oh, they all thought I was mentally ill. I mean, and this literally just happened. So I'm not making this up. So I, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I, I get. I understand the question. People who were really like, I think, um, I think of Jung. Jung said modern psychology is like psychology without the psyche. They forgot about the psyche, <laughs> you know. And and so the idea being is that because I'm not, I don't have, I've never taken a class in any of this stuff, but I'm a student of the psyche, and I think that's what psychologists need is to really contemplate. You know, I mean, according to Jung, the greatest discovery of the 20th century in psychology in his words, were, was the um, discovery of the reality of the psyche, mm -hmm. that the psyche had an ontological reality and that our visions, our dreams, our intuitions, that they were ontologically as real as the physical matter. And so unfortunately, modern psychology has gotten really entranced in, in the whole scientific materialistic point of view. They think that matter is primary instead of consciousness and so many of the people, they're just behaviorists or they deal with pharmaceuticals. And instead of how about just connecting with the person? And, you know, because I think maybe even more than half of what we're all suffering from, it's true for me, was not being seen. Like when I was going through my experience of, of trying to heal from this incredible abuse that I received from my father, you know, and then I got thrown into psychiatry they absolutely they they didn't they could not register you know the abuse that i was like openly trying to transmit to them that i was suffering from and then they overlaid on me a misdiagnosis and then on top of that they they didn't recognize the the spiritual awakening part and then on top of that they then medicated me and then from all of that i became sick and as soon as I became sick, that confirmed their diagnosis. Oh, he really is mentally ill because look how sick he is. It was I could not believe the abuse that I suffered from psychiatry. But as my awakening continued, I began to understand that was part of my awakening. That was like a yes. descent into the hell realm. And I never would have believed in a million years that that went on. So yeah, I, I have a lot. I have a lot to say about this. And I'm just fortunate that I was able to get through this, but it destroyed my family. My parents both died because in their mind, you know, psychiatrists were authority figures who know something and they bought into their diagnosis and it was tragic, you know. Here's a question 
uh, that says, how is, uh, Paul, how is the second book different from the first title <laughs> in your series, Dispelling Wetiko? Uh, please shed light on the nature of the content of this book from a comparative point of view. Yeah, 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 for sure. No, and that's a good question. <laughs> Because, you know, I thought Dispelling Watiko, okay, that was it for me as far as writing about Watiko. And then I just kept on getting downloads. And it was like I had tapped into the source, you know, that just kept on giving and giving. And this new book, one of the main themes is pointing out how different spiritual traditions all throughout history have been pointing at Watiko. And but they're using different names. You see, because the, what the underlying theme of this book is, is trying to help people to see Watiko, because Watiko is this blindness. It's a form, you see, it's a form of blindness. It's a peculiar form of blindness. It's a form of blindness that, that doesn't know it's blind. And not only does it not know it's blind, it thinks it's more sighted than people who actually see. And <laughs> it can't see the darkness. It can't see its own shadow. And not only that, it can't see its own light. I mean, it's an all around type of blindness. And when we're afflicted with it, and we all potentially have it because it pervades the collective unconscious, then you know we're just oblivious to what we're acting out in the world. And so what I'm trying to point out is to help people how to see it. And I point out that you know it makes no sense to preach the light to people whose eyes are blind because you know then the one who's blind is you it makes much better sense to actually teach people the art of seeing. And of course, that's a whole other discussion. How do you do that? So on the one hand, it's not just spiritual traditions that have been pointing at Watiko that I talk about in the book that's different than the, the first book. But then I also bring in a lot of different philosophers and thinkers and creative artists and writers who in their own way are completely pointing at Watiko, didn't have the name for it, and I'm bringing in all these articulations. It's like when, when the physicists discovered the quantum, one of the images they use is like the quantum was like this weird animal that they had in an animal house with all these windows around and they would go around the windows and they would each describe what they saw and they were trying to put together the images of what they saw through, you know, through these windows to try to understand what was this weird creature, you know, called the quantum. Now, Watiko, it's a quantum phenomena, and quantum physics, you know, I should just add, is actually offering us the medicine for Watiko. I, that's what my last book was about. But the point is, is that I'm really trying to bring in so many different creative people and spiritual people who are articulating Watiko so as to help us to see it. The question from Susan, uh, how can sacred activism help us awaken to a Tico and move to transcend it? Yeah, well, I want to ask Andrew, because that's, you know, I right away from when I hear the word sacred activism, Andrew, that's that's up your alley. Um, you know, I, I, I talk about the same thing, but I really want I'd to hear what to you hear have to say. On it. I'd love to hear you. This is your time. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, it's funny because um, when I first found out about sacred, uh, the phrase sacred activism that Andrew had coined, I had been using the term um, spiritually informed political activism, where you had, you know, you have to sort of bring together spiritual awareness. And it's not just something, you know, that you're passively sitting in your room, meditating, doing mantras, and everything's going to be good. No, the world's burning. And you're just too self-absorbed if you don't realize that your inner process is manifesting as the outer world. You know, they're not separate. And so when we actually have whatever understanding we have and and you know whatever form of awakening that's coming through us and then connect with other people who are also awakening in their own way and of course it's not that everybody's gonna gonna you know have books that they're writing like me or andrew or whatever we each have our own vocation our own calling and when you connect with other people who are also tapping in to who they are and their what they're you know what they're here to do it's contagious it it actually the creative genius it's what i call um we can conspire to co-inspire each other it's a real conspiracy theory where it activates the collective <laughs> genius in a way where the whole is greater than the sum of its parts and um and you know then all bets are off because like i've been saying and i'll i'll, I'll say it this way 
we've, you know, we have the diagnosis. I mean, Watiko is a perfect diagnosis for what's happening, but it's meaningless unless we take it online into our psyches because it's a participatory medicine. We have to step into it. Then that's like quantum physics. You know, we have to step into it and engage with the world to activate the healing benefit of the medicine that's encoded in Watiko, or it doesn't do us any good. We could have all the diagnoses we want and it's meaningless. And, and I want to point out that the, the cure, the solution of all the myriad world crises, we've, it's already been discovered. We have it. We possess it. Every one of us, we already have what we need. It's not like something outside of ourselves is going to come and enlighten us or save us. No, we already have the medicine. We have all everything we need, but we don't know we have it. And that's what I'm trying to point out. And that's what I'm trying to do in my life is continually cultivate and to deepen my realization of this. Would you say that sacred activism is in a way the antidote to Wetiko? What Wetiko is designed to drive us into so we can discover this massive conspiratorial creativity we have? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because when here's what Tico, which is just when we identify with a fictitious separate self. And as long as we do that, then we're it's like we have a cocoon around us and we're suffocating ourselves. Right. So it's terrifying. forcing us. Paralyzed, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And turn to stone. Exactly. And then when we actually have the recognition of what's being shown to us and we hook up with other people, you know, through a real open heart and empathy and love and compassion and really helping each other, you know, in their own process, of course, and we get as much benefit as they do because we're not separate. That, and, and keep in mind that what Tico is, the, is at the bottom of that, that was actually the inspiration for all of, for that whole process of us awakening to who we are. Because when we awaken to who we are, you discover, wait, I'm not who I've been imagining myself to be. I don't exist as a separate self. And that there is a way of conspiring with each other, of being together and inspiring each other you know, and that's the sacred activism, you know, and in a way that is the total antidote and but it's also the offspring of Watiko, you know. All right, I think we will uh, wrap up with one more question. Um, this is from Diana. Does your book also offer some practices to help people see? Yeah, well, it's interesting. Because from one point of view, from, from my point of view, the whole book is a practice yes. helping people to see. Yes. And, um, and yeah, there are, there are actually definite practices in the book, but you know, I'm every word in the book, I'm continually trying to, you know, open people's eyes that there is nothing stopping us from seeing what I'm pointing at. And then when you see that and keep in mind, you don't see it as an object. It's not, you know, like that. Um, you know, then all of a sudden something in you opens. And so I don't know how else to say it, except, I mean, it sounded Andrew, like that spoke to you who's read the book a couple of times already. The book you know? is itself a major spiritual practice because to be able to, first of all, it's written with such concentrated genius and deep humility. And you realize that this man has been through this experience to the end of it is bringing back the fundamental clarities we need and just reading it slowly. I've read it twice. I'm going to start again. But each time I read it, I read it as a spiritual practice itself and allow my own imagination, my own experience, my own understanding of the world to light up what Paul has written. This is a sacred text. The second thing is, is that the most important practice is simply what we've been talking about. We've been talking about spiritual practice in general. We've been talking about transpersonal psychology. We've been talking about creativity. We've been talking about service. These are the practices that you need to get in touch with what is so powerful within you that you can actually have the strength to absorb what Paul has put down on these pages. Because I found, as many people who have read this book, because I've given it to all my friends and we're talking about it all the time, and what we've all found is that it takes you, you can't read it the way all the way through. You have to take it slowly because if you read it too fast, you waste the massive impact of it. And the way that I found myself able to 
read it is to actually meditate deeply so I become as strong in myself so that I can actually stand the penetrating depth of what Paul is saying. So that's my two cents about it. Well, well, thank you, Andrew. That's that's wild. Thank you. This is a very, very great piece of work, and it can help the world in ways that are incalculable. And I just beg everybody to buy copies for all their aunts, uncles, friends, dogs, cats, everybody, because <laughs> everyone needs to read this book. Thank wow. you so much, Paul and Andrew. Well, Here's what the book looks you, like. Yeah. And uh, in the chat, I am going to post the link to Watiko, Paul's book right there. And that's in the chat, so go ahead and click on that. Get it from powells.com. Thanks, Andrew. I have a couple of Andrew's books here, too. Many books here at Powell's. And we thank him for being part of tonight's event. Thanks, everyone at home for watching. Um, our Can YouTube. Let me just say before you oh, end, yeah. go that ahead. Both for you, both me and Paul, Powell's is the simply the greatest bookstore in the world. And we both salute you and thank you for the fabulous prodigality of everything that you offer bless you thank you thank you so much um and if people uh want to share this event by sharing uh by showing it to their friends um you can check it out on our youtube channel that will probably be going up sometime tomorrow i just put the link to our youtube channel in the chat so click on that and check out all of our past events and this event will be going up tomorrow um, thank you so much again, Paul and Andrew, and everyone hey, at home. Thank you, totally. God and, bless uh, you, Paul. God yeah, bless you. Great seeing you. Thank you. Have a great Bye. night. You too. Thank you.